That's the current version of the Hollywood stars singing along with the band's 1974 version of King of the Nighttime World, a song eventually covered quite successfully by Kiss. The Hollywood stars were formed by rock and roll Svengali Kim Fowley back in 73 as the West Coast answer to the New York Dolls. Fast forward 50 years and the Hollywood stars are about to release a new album titled Starstruck. Here is original lead singer Scott Fares and new guy Jeff Gerard who co-wrote Total Control for the Motels. Between them, they've got plenty of stories to tell. The, I do have, believe it or not, one of the old albums, which I don't think either one of you are on, but... Uh, <laughs> that is that is true. That was the album that, that was the first album that came out, but actually the third album that was recorded. Right. But you are on this one, right? Yes, okay. yes, I am the, if, I am the, uh, one of the, uh, <laughs> I think I'm wearing a white jacket in that, but uh -huh. anyway, I had long hair. Yeah, so did I. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, is that, <laughs> that must be you here, I think. Yeah, that's me looking all cocky and badass. <laughs> Those are the days. Fantastic. Yeah. So are you still cocky and badass in uh, 2024? Yes, he is. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> Excellent. That's good to hear. All righty. So, I think em emphasis on cocky. All right. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> so you got a new album out, uh, coming out yep. called Starstruck. So, Jeff, how did you get involved with the band? Because Scott's been there since day one, on and off. Not since, but on and off. Uh, yeah, there you go. Ooh, there I am. Yes, on the uh, new Steve. How did I get involved? Yeah. Um, <laughs> kind of a convoluted way, uh, sort of a side door. I was on YouTube looking at demos of some equipment, and the guy demoing it seemed to really know what he was doing. So I messaged him, and we went back and forth a few times. And it turns out we're both total gearheads. Right. So we went off on gear like total geeks and nerds. And, uh, that led to, well, why don't we just get together and like, you know, geek out? Yep. Okay, cool. So where do you live? Turns out he lived about six blocks from here. So <laughs> I popped over there and while we were jamming and trying out equipment, he says, you know, m maybe you'd like to come and see this band I just joined. You might like it. You know, it's fun. And that was it. Oh, yeah, very good. And, and were you familiar with the, uh, anything to do with the band before that? Only the name. Only the name. Yeah. Well, there you go. Because you were, at the same time that they were putting out that album that I just waved around, you were kind of doing your thing with the motels and other stuff, right? Oh, it was actually way before that. And Tom um, Petty. I, I came out like what I like what I would call thin evidence and high hopes. Right. You know? <laughs> um, I got a phone call to come join a project that sounded kind of iffy, but I needed to get out of my hometown. So I took the invitation and... It was good for about six months, fell apart, and then just one thing after another uh, that, in the end, uh, led to the motels. Right. But, you know, long road up to there. Yeah. Now, you wrote to co wrote Total Control, which I don't know if you're aware of this, and you may be, was a huge uh, TV ad for Subaru here in New Zealand. And they had another person singing it, and it sounded exactly like the motels version. In fact, the, the girl who sang it is, is a friend of mine, so I just checked with her yesterday. I was like, that was you singing that version of Total Control. So did you get massive royalties from that? Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's good. More than she got it, for sure. So. Yeah, well, actually, I have half of that one. Uh, yeah. Um, what, what was the girl's name? Caitlin um, Smith. Oh, I saw her video, yeah. Oh. I saw her. Oh, she the one that does that? Yeah, we we yeah we checked that video out recently. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yep, she still she just lives around the corner from me here. And I see her all the time. <laughs> oh, you you tell her hi for me. I, I, I will. You. She wanted to say hi to you, so that that's good. And the uh, the other person that we uh, I also was a friend somewhat of Ken Fowley. We uh, made a ah. we made a record together with a band up in Rochester called Uncle Sam a few years back, and uh, so I know he was in integral in starting the, all this up, making the Hollywood stars the quote unquote West Coast version of the New York Dolls. Is that right? I think he likes to say West Coast answer. Oh, the, the answer. <laughs> yeah, we were we were not a version. We didn't dress like them. Right. We didn't play like them. So it's like okay. You guys have the dolls. We have the stars. That was kind of his thought. All right. And, and I'd be really interested as an outsider to hear you guys' opinion of Kim, because I only knew him like in passing and a few chats and ran into him at an apartment building and in a party. And I, I found him pretty disagreeable. So I'd really like to hear your version. I, I, well, I'll tell you, my, my version is, I, listen, I was friends with Kim. 
but he was not a nice person. And he made a career out of being kind of, you know, mean and, and sarcastic and that sort of thing. I mean, he was a genius and I know because he told me he was. Um, <laughs> That's I you know. know. <laughs> yeah, I believe that. Uh, <laughs> but I, uh, I, I met him, I guess like 1972 or something, our first interaction. And then uh, I, in 1973, I had, I went off to Boston for a year and I came back and like the first night I was in town, I went to Rodney's uh, English disco and Kim walked up to me at the bar and said, you're going to be the new lead singer in my, the band I'm starting up called the Hollywood stars. I'm like, Oh, okay. I'm out of work. Why not? Yeah. You know? So next thing I know I'm at SIR and Terry and Ruben are there. I didn't know Terry and Ruben at the time. And we auditioned basically bass players. And uh, ultimately we picked one Gary Van Dyke. And then we rehearsed a few times and then Kim brought Mark Anthony out. And then that, that was the band. And uh, he was kind of our Sven Gali, yep. <laughs> if you will, you know, not screwing with the gender there, just simply he was, uh, we did whatever he told us to do as far as music, songs, appearance, whatever. And uh, he was the king of hype. I can tell you that. Yep, yep, yep. And everybody knew Kim and Kim knew everybody. So. <laughs> So did you find that when you had something he needed or wanted, he was really nice to you? Uh, no, I don't think he used charm really to get what he wanted. He was more uh, direct, <laughs> more commanding. I Some years later when I was rehearsing with Hero, he was working with some other band in another rehearsal studio. And I saw him walking out. I said, Kim. And he kind of looked at me and he goes, oh, you're in the Con Merton death band. I'm like, why are you so mean? I mean? What did I do to you? And he goes, listen, there are two kinds of people, either my friends or my enemies. And my friends make me money, make me laugh or get me high. And you don't do any of those things. So you're my enemy. And I'm like, oh, my God. I said, Kim, you were actually wearing underwear I gave you like three Christmases ago. So I, I don't understand. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I think he was mellower when yeah, I met him because I met him around in the early 90s. And uh, mm. we, made, we quit, made a quick record together. And, I, and he did come to my house and have dinner with me and my kids and stuff. So <laughs> it, it, well, it was I, quite listen, entertaining back, back and in, pretty, pretty cool. Back in, the se back in the 70s, I remember he, he came to our apartment once for like Easter or something. Because he was, you know, he was a lo really basically a lonely guy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he was sort of like, oh, you know, his family stuff, you know, because he had a really screwed up family. Right. Uh, Not his, surprised. His, yeah, his dad was a actor, uh, an actor, and wasn't around. He was like a B actor, you know. He wasn't anybody big and famous. And his mother, he told me, had been one of uh, Howard Hughes's girls or something like that. And yeah. and she, uh, I don't know if you read his book, The Lord of Garbage, but uh, <laughs> no, that's I mean, great he, title. The, basically, in the first sentence of the book, he says, "I'm a genius," and he talked about how he was reading when he was three and all this crap and. How his mother put him on a train, strapped him in, and sent him up to her sister in Seattle, and he couldn't even get up to go to the bathroom or eat or anything. So, you know, like I said, he was the king of hype. Yep, yep, yep. You know? And he made some good records. I love Animal Man. <laughs> so, yeah. well, no, I mean, some of the stuff he did with the Runaways, they wouldn't let him uh, in the recording studio when the Hollywood stars are recording. Right. Um, they said, well, he is a producer and you can't have another producer in the room. Right. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. That really upset Kim. He was livid. He wanted to produce the band anyway, but the record label didn't want him yeah. to. So. And of course, anyway. the runways have different things to say about Kim, which is probably... Yeah. I mean, if you talk to Joan Jett, you get a different point of view yeah. than you do the other yeah. the other women in the band. Yep, that... but, uh, yeah, he was, he was uh, an enigma, if nothing else. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, he was unknowable. All right, back to the Hollywood stars and this new record. Yes. So, uh, so how did the record get to come together? Because you guys reunited and split up and changed around, yeah. and now you've come to this. Yeah. So let me just back up a little bit before Jeff got in the band. So, the band got back together in 2018, and Terry, Mike, and I, who are still in the band, are in the band, and we had uh, Ruben DeFontes was in it and uh, Ches Monroe. So 
Terry Ray, who was on the original, he, Terry Ray has been on every single uh, Hollywood stars recording. He's the only one. Right. Uh, and Michael Romans was the bass player on the album you held up earlier, and he was the on the ba- he was the bass player on Sound City. Anyway, so we get the band back together. Michael left the band. We got another bass player. That guy left the band. We got another bass player. That guy left the band. We got Michael back, and then Ruben and Ches left the band, and so we got George Keller. This is the mysterious geek head that uh, uh, right. Jeff was <laughs> talking about. And George was a great fit, great guy, um, and I liked his sort of musical tastes and sensibility. And so we started rehearsing with just the four of us, but our manager, Lauren Molinari, he stood in for guitar. I was going to play guitar and not have a fifth member, but after a while, everybody convinced me, no, it's better if you're not. So, But the first six tracks we did, we did before Jeff joined the band, and uh Lauren plays guitar. Ah. And and then and this was all very quick. I mean, this was like within a month or something. And and Jeff joined the band right after that. We came up with seven more songs we wanted to do. And we went back in the studio uh, several months after that and uh, recorded the next seven tracks. And uh, yeah, so that's so Jeff's on seven of the tracks and and Lauren's on six of the tracks. Otherwise, the other four of us are on all the tracks. And uh, yeah, Jeff, I mean, we did, Lauren really pushed us doing total control. And it was like pulling teeth, I think, to get. Oh, that was uh, his our, idea. Our, <laughs> yeah, I, thought, our I thought you were a big fan and wanted to do it. I got that story. Oh, so no, I, listen. No, I love the song. I was worried I couldn't do it. <laughs> no, I know. I, I saw this big interview you did, and I thought, wow, it's really nice. You gave me all that credit, Jeff. But really, it was yeah. Lauren was pushing the song. Yeah. And Lauren pushed a certain way of doing it. And. Jeff was a little resistant, and then you can pick up the story about why you gave in on the arrangement when you took it home. Well, uh, it's just that, you know, the, the way it was originally arranged, which is the way everybody does it, just almost almost cloning the, the recording of the Motels version, the whole thing was set up to be as stark and empty as possible to highlight Martha's voice, which was the, the magic ingredient, right? And unless you have that voice, it's not much of an arrangement, you know. <laughs> so um, it, there also didn't seem any point to doing like the 15th, you know, clone of the song. So uh, Lauren or somebody suggested that, you know, see if you can find some way to bring up the tempo. It, it's too low energy for this band. So I started listening to songs that might work that were sort of somewhere in the ballpark of the tempo, but faster. And when I when I came across Paul Westerberg's solo album where he did a tune called I'm a Dirty Diesel, and you can probably find that. I'm sure we can. <laughs> um, I really like that tune. I mean, I listened to it for, for kicks, you know, and I started to think, well, we could probably lay that on top of total control and see where it goes. So we tried it a few times at rehearsal and it, it clicked, you know. Uh, Scott, you you found a place to to jump in with it when it was at that tempo. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 a little raunchier, you know, more uh, honestly, a little more masculine, which was what I think Lauren was going for. But yeah. I, the part I was hoping you would remember and you didn't is that <laughs> you were still a little doubtful about you know, I, you know I'm a little, uh, and you took it home and you came back in the next rehearsal and said, okay. Played it for my wife. She said it was sexy, so it's fine. We're going to do it. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that detail. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the only detail I remember. <laughs> oh, well. And you guys have a yeah. gig coming up at uh, the Viper Room. So that sounds mm-hmm. – is there still a Viper Room? Is, is Johnny Depp? Just barely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, uh, you know, they run, I guess, you know, six or seven nights a week. Right. and. uh yeah, it's still there. It's still, you know, a block and a half from the whiskey. It's uh, um, despite, you know, a tragedy that happened there many years ago. Right. It's a pretty happening place. I've been there a few times. And it's fun. Yeah, so <laughs> us and several other bands are playing on the 15th of June. And uh, we hope everybody comes out to see us. All right. Yeah. Now, I see the- Another thing about the, the, the club is that um, – it's going to be torn down. That whole strip of buildings is coming down and they're going to continue with their uh, high rise 
plan for that part of town. And so if it, you know, that'll be the end of it. Yeah. If not now, when, you know, yeah, yep. yeah okay. it's, it's inevitable. Uh, so no. probably, I say probably before the end of the year, the end of an era. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Now I see the album opens with a track called can't do it right, which I think Scott, you made a video for So why is it the yeah, beginning? Yeah. Why did the video? Open your So it's our second, our second single, right? It's like one that's currently out. And uh, so we did Taxi Driver before that, yep. our first single. And I, you know, I had done, you know, taken the band in like a, like a hall or whatever rehearsal place, a big, you know, whatever, and done live videos before. And, you know, they're good, but they're expensive and they're, takes everybody to do it and it's a big thing to organize. So I was talking to George Keller and uh, he said, oh, I came across this AI website that or app or whatever, it's on a web thing, Fireframe. And he said, I, here's what I did for Can't Do It Right. And it was like, you know, five seconds. And it looked pretty cool. So I did it for Taxi Driver, and it came out way better than I ever imagined. And it cost me like ten dollars to do it. <laughs> and so uh, I did it for Can't Do It Right as well, which was much harder. The lyrics don't lend themselves to the scenes transitioning very well and stuff like that. But that's why I did it. Now we have recently done another video. I don't want to tip too much here, but we did one in our rehearsal studio with cameras oh, and the whole bit. lip syncing and all that. Yeah. yeah. So that'll be our, our third video will be an actual live, you know, a band lip sync thing, but I was enamored with it, but you know, I think two in a row is enough, but. <clears throat> all right. Yeah. Very good. And, and um, the taxi driver tune, that's, that was one that was originally done by hero. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. So it's interesting, I, you cool. guys put this album together, you, you know, you've taken songs from your past, you've got some new ones. What kind of discussions exactly. did you guys as a band have about how you saw this record coming together? I don't know, what's your point of view, Jeff? I mean, I can, I can get mine, but I've been talking a long time, so. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I'm, I don't uh, have much to add to it. I mean, I, you know, I didn't bring total control with me. Uh, it was Lauren's idea. So I would basically, you know, play the role of a passenger and helper, right? You know, this song needs this, this song needs that. So, uh, I didn't really have much of a master overall view of the album. I was just waiting to see how it took shape, you know? Okay. Well then back to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, we, like you said, we had some older songs and we had some brand new and then some that were new, but, you know, not like yesterday new. And uh, we we're just trying to get the same basic, I don't know, personality, if you will, in the songs, even though the songs like, I don't know, Haunted and Am I Right or Wrong or Sleeping Giant are completely different than Taxi Driver, Can't Do It Right, and Total Control and Walking With an Angel are completely different than those. You still feel like it's the same band playing. It has the same energy and the same basic style underneath. And so that, I mean, it's hard to explain how it came together, but it, we did it very quickly. Uh -huh. We, the, the first six songs we recorded over a four day period, Friday through Monday. And then again, with the last seven, we did in a four day stretch as well. So we were really well rehearsed. We went in we, there and just knocked them out. 
And we didn't go in with this idea that we're going to overdub 50 things. Yep. What you see is what you get. I, you know, it's pretty much live. Uh, obviously vocals are overdubbed and stuff like that, but not a lot of extra stuff. Um, I think the most produced song on there would be shortage of love and Michael overdubbed a cello, oh, right. which was his, in- his instrument when he was in music school. And uh, let's see, we overdubbed a 12 string guitar lightly somewhere, Mm -hmm. but very little was added. I know our uh, engineer slash co-producer, Paul Rossler at Kit and Robot, he put in a few little keyboard parts here and there for color, but just, it's almost just the band and nothing else. And to me, it sounds bigger and brighter that way. Cool. cool. Yeah. And another thing I like about it is that um, we rehearsed the act of recording, you know, Mm. because we, we always were rehearsing for performance. So for quite a long time, we were rehearsing for recording. And the upside is if you like what you hear on the album, that's what we sound like live because that's what we played. It's not studio magic. Right. All right. One of the songs I wanted to touch on, which I think Michael wrote, is Haunted, which I it kind of stood out for me. It's got some great twangy kind of thing going on. What can you enlighten me about that one? Anything to, to well, elaborate? That on? was in the first that was in the first batch of six. Right? And uh, uh, all all cards on the table, the sloths that Mike when Michael was in the sloths, the sloths right? did that song. We do it differently and um George was the one who had the kind of Dwayne Eddy guitar thing going on. Gotcha, there. gotcha. And uh, I don't know if you if you listen closely to the song, I did overdub me whispering on top of all the lead vocals. Okay. I, I don't know how clear that is, just to make it a little creepier. Okay, but <laughs> no, uh, give it another. Look. Yeah, Michael had that. Michael had that song, and we just did it our way. And uh, it's it's a unique song on the album, and uh, I. I like every song in the album. Obviously, I like some better than others, but there isn't a single song I go, ah, oh, right. I wish we hadn't done that. <laughs> well, that's good. I think Walking with an fact, Angel must be a, a fact, new one, right? Walking with an Angel, because you both of you wrote that with with, uh, with George. George, yeah. Yeah, George wrote that, and um, we were rehearsing it, and we said, oh, it's got to have a bridge. Well, I don't know if you know the way we work. So I live on the East Coast. The rest of guys live in L.A. Oh, so that. I periodically, like I'm going out uh, Wednesday, right. a week from today, to rehearse for the band before our, our gig. So I rehearse at home to recordings from the rehearsals, and they rehearse you know, to the same thing, but we're not together all the time. Anyway, so I, one of these times I went back to the East Coast, and I came back, and there was this bridge chords and whatever that Jeff had written, but there was nothing else. It was just music. And so I just sort of started, huh? I didn't write the bridge. I wrote the little uh, guitar hook. Uh, George's friend came up with um, the bridge chords. Oh, I thought you did. No, he, and it's interesting. He pointed, somebody pointed out those chords you picked for the bridge. Those are the nowhere man chords. Yeah, (laughs) that was me. I figured out different key, but well, we had a discussion about there should be another. It just goes these two chords, like what is it, B minor to C or something like that. And I came up with a melody and some lyrics. And uh, Michael, I think, thought, well, we shouldn't do those same chords over and over again. It'll get boring. And I said, they're the same exact chords as the chorus to Nowhere Man. I think we can do it. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. That's what it was, yeah. So is there a, a plan moving forward once this record is out? Are, are, is this a long-term thing for you guys? Are you having a good time? Nobody's getting any younger, obviously, including myself. So, <laughs> Yeah, well, there obviously is a, time, a built-in physical time limit that we don't know. Right. Uh, but I don't know. You can chime in here, Jeff. For me, I'm I'm having fun again. There was a while there I wasn't having fun in the band, and I thought, oh God, do I really want to do this anymore? I've been doing it for five years or four years, whatever. But I'm having a lot of fun now. Um, in fact, we're already talking about some new songs, right. even though we haven't even put this album out yet. Yeah. And uh, you know, Lauren's talking about us going to Europe next year, so we're trying to you know work it out. We. we 
I don't think we're in a position where we can be like a full-time touring band or anything like that. Yep. But uh, I think selective things, you know, maybe play New York and Boston and, you know, some things like that in addition. I, that's what I'd like to do. I mean, I, I'd love it if some name band said, hey, you want to be our opening act for two or three weeks? I'd be like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm having fun. Uh, you know, it's kind of like going back to visit your old school, you know, <laughs> after you're all grown up, because, you know, this is the kind of rock music that was happening when I first got to California, and then I moved on, you know, yeah. and now to come back to it, it's kind of like, oh, this, this is great. I, I know what to do here. Yeah. You know, and uh, so it, 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 it's, it's, it has a different feeling than it did before. Now it's just like, uh, it's just fun. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, I, w I don't, none of us are sitting there thinking we're going to get rich or famous off this, although we take it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, but, but back in the day, the time frame that uh, Jeff's talking about, this was it. Yeah. You know, we were tense. It was like, we had to make it. This is what we're going to do. We didn't have any real fallback back plan. And, and so, everything was taken much more seriously. When we play live now, I have the best time. I don't care if there's, I literally don't, I mean, I do, do want to be packed, but we have played to like 10 people and we've played to much bigger crowds. Yeah. And I have as just about as good a time, no matter what. And I, I can tell you whether I was in hero or the Hollywood stars back in the seventies, if the crowd wasn't enthusiastic, if there wasn't a big enough crowd, if things went wrong, I just shut down. I didn't like it. And I was unhappy and stressed out. And, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't feel that way now. Yeah, everything, everything uh, had such significance back then because you're hungry yeah. and and you have a sense of desperation about things and you measure everything in millimeters. You know, like oh, we're going down. Oh, oh, you know, that was a bad gig. Well, we're ruined. That's all gone. Right. You know, all right, it's just, right. we're just surfing now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, surfing. Back to the Beach Boys. <laughs> Back to the Beach Boys, Surfing USA. Very good. All right, well, I'll le let you guys go. Th uh, thank you very much for taking, oh, there it is. Yep, it's coming out. <laughs> Viper Room, June 15th. Yay! Starstruck, Star Trek, June, Star Trek, Star Starstruck, <laughs> June 14th. 